My name is Sue Scott. Um, I'm substituting for Kathy Loyola today, so um, I'm somewhat familiar with the presentation, but I am familiar with the idea. For our purposes, the transition zone is that area from, next slide, from your lanai to the littoral zone. And what we've been talking about today is a lot of cooperation between stakeholders and residents. I love this picture because I am a cat person. Look who's on top. Just saying. <laughs> who's smarter, cats or dogs? <laughs> I think we know the answer. Um, but it does take uh, cooperation between everybody in order to make good things happen. Next slide. So now uh, we're talking about planting your transition zone with appropriate plants. Go ahead. What are appropriate plants? Well, most transition zones from that edge of your lanai to the littoral zone where those wetland plants are, in most places, uh, 20, 30 years ago, were planted with Floritam turf grass. Okay? Um, not a good choice of plant for that zone for many reasons. We're going to cover that. Florida native plants, they do great. In spite of the fact that the soil your house is on is probably dug up from way below and is not native to your site, it's still the kind of soil that the right kind of native plants are used to. We do have native plants that love sand with low nutrients, just like those native algae, which are so important to the health of your pond. You'll notice a theme here in Florida. Everything depends on low nutrient load, not high nutrient load. Water type, whether it's fresh, brackish, or salt, you do need to know that when planting your zone, whether it's transitional or littoral. Sunshade conditions. If a plant loves shade, it does not like growing in full sun and vice versa. Cold tolerance and heat tolerance. This is a tough one because our climate is changing. I've lived here 48 years. Trust me, things will never be the same. Winter is not the same. I am now recommending to people when they come to the nursery where I work that they look for natives that have a wider range of tolerance of temperature, something native to zones 8 or 9 through 11 because we're having extremes of heat and cold. Or... Eh, non-native plants that are not invasive blah 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 I'm going to focus on natives next slide so the transition zone in nature is just slightly above that water line to our upland areas but for practical purposes of this talk again it is the edge of our lanai down to that littoral shelf of the pond go ahead what are the benefits of planting that transition zone with something other than turf grass. Keep in mind that this whole love of turf grass is left over from the 1800s and England and wealth and look what I own. The paradigm, I believe, of what constitutes a beautiful landscape is changing. We now are seeing more and more landscapes, including within HOAs, laws can be changed, where the landscape is planted with plants that are beautiful and that this is now what's accepted and considered attractive. So that you can use the right plants to beautify your landscape. Erosion is a huge, huge problem. Plant roots help solve that problem. Here's the biggie. <laughs> Eliminate the need for fertilizers and pesticides by using the right plant in the right place. Thank you, Dr. Thomas, for your work. I mean, I have been feeling throughout this program so far very sad. After watching that Awaken video, I mean, I get very emotional about this. This is my home. And it's so good to see science backing up what many of us already know intuitively. Again, in Florida, for healthy landscapes, you need less nutrient load. And we do not have 365 days of growing season in Florida. We have four months of growing season in Florida during the rainy season. Plants do not grow during the dry months. They survive. We've got to stop pouring fertilizer on everything <laughs> to fix it. That's a big issue. Prevent waste from entering the water. Pet waste is another biggie. Our own waste. What do we have control over? We have control over ourselves, 
our behavior, our HOAs, our city councils, our pets, and our children. We have control over them. Reduce that nutrient load into your pond. Today we've been talking about how to fix the problem because that's how America works. Here's my question. What if the problem never existed to begin with? That's the focus I'm going to take. And we provide habitat for wildlife, including mosquito-eating critters, which is always good. Okay. I think that's a real pretty picture. <laughs> I really do. But here's the problem with it. You see right at the water's edge, everything's planted and how beautiful it looks. What do you see just above that edge? <laughs> turf grass. What do you think people put on that turf grass, whether it needs it or not? Fertilizer. Whether it needs it or not. All the nitrogen in the world will not make that grass green. Iron makes it green, just so you know. Perceived negatives of planting your transitional zone. It'll look weedy. Only if you plant a weedy plant. Block the view of the pond. Only if you plant a line of plants right along your view. Attract unwanted wildlife. A lot of studies have shown that those alligators that everyone's terrified of, they like to come up where there's no plantings because <laughs> it's easier for them. So just a little hint there. Next slide. Without even looking at all the information, let's just forget all the science just for a moment. Which one do you want to live next to, the one on the left or the one on the right? The one on the right, because it's pretty. That's the one that's going to increase your property value. That's the one that's going to make people keep coming back and keep our economy growing. Not the one on the left. That's where all the problems are. We need to plant these ponds and mimic nature. We need to plant that littoral zone, and we need to plant the transition zone. Next slide. How do I determine the right plant for the right place? Again, using those Florida native plants, you have to understand what you have. Do you have shade, sun? Do you have a space of only five feet? Well, then you don't plant a plant that gets 20 feet wide. It really is that simple. Do you want to add color? Do you want to attract wildlife? Do you want all of the above? I know I do. So which plants are going to meet your desires? Go ahead. There are bulletproof plants. There are plants in Florida, native to South Florida, that go sun, eh, no problem. Hot, no problem. Sand, eh, okay. Too much water, all right, I'll live through it. There are plants that can handle that. There really are, and they're beautiful. And grasses. I always encourage people to use grasses to soften the landscape, to soften all the hard edges we create. These are beautiful plants. Go ahead. Shrubs. Cocoa, cl cocoa plum, Florida privet, two of my favorites. Absolutely amazing plants. How about the cabbage palm, sable palm? That's our state tree. It's gorgeous. It can go from wet to dry. Doesn't care. Loves it all. Go ahead. No matter what you plant, you must prevent soil and mulch from entering the water. So that's a biggie. Go ahead. Sunshine mimosa is actually being used as an alternative to turf grass. Not so much in um, uh, developments, but individuals throughout southwest Florida are going to this. It looks like Horton Hears a Who, that little powder puff, you know, little Whoville. Butterflies can't get enough of it, and I've actually seen Cassius Blues laying their eggs on it, so it's pretty amazing. Uh, thickest in full sun. It does die back a little in the cold winter, but it rebounds quickly. Go ahead. Matchstick, uh, Phyllonotiflora, also known as Creeping Charlie. It's not a weed. This is the answer to your problem in your swales. This plant loves to get wet. And guess what? Three species of nadir butterfly lay their eggs on it, and they all love to nectar on it. It gets this high. You don't need turf grass. If you combine that with some sunshine mimosa, you're done, and you never have to mow again. Go ahead. <laughs> this is what happens when you mix three things together. Non-native perennial peanut, sunshine mimosa, and phytonotiflora. You get 
green that you can walk on, do anything to, never mow, attract butterflies, never fertilize, and you're done. Okay? Another great plant for that transition zone that allows you to see the water. I know that's a big issue. Quailberry. It only gets like six inches tall. This tall. Plant this in a mulch plant bed. Boom, you're done. And the birds will love you. Okay. Golden creeper, which we have right out front here. And it's actually been turned into a mini hedge. Something I personally hate doing to plants but what's cool about this plant it only gets a couple of feet high you can actually do it and it looks great it makes a little tiny mini hedge this is this is actually more of a beach plant but it can tolerate the parking lot out here where it's hot and miserable and exhaust and no fertilizer no care and no water and it looks like that how amazing go ahead here we've got a combination, sunshine mimosa instead of turf grass, golden creeper for a mini hedge, and everything looks very manicured. That does not look weedy or unkempt. It looks like somebody cares. Go ahead. Okay, this guy can get out of, can get out of control. <laughs> Beach dune sunflower is a dune plant. It's used to growing in sand with extremely low nutrients, very little detritus. One plant will get five foot in diameter and about two and a half feet high. <laughs> By the mailbox, you only need one. You gotta trust me on this. Um, but if you, have, if, you're, if you have a community with an area where it's sandy and nothing else will grow and people want some green, here you go. The only problem is at the end of summer, it looks kind of crappy because it actually hates water. You can kill it by watering it too much. So you cut it back, you get another whole year out of it, then you go and pull it up, babies are underneath and ready to go. So if you have a sandy cul-de-sac, for example, nothing else will grow there for you, put in a couple of those. And it's gorgeous all winter long. Here we have a bit of a transition zone planting. There's still turf grass in the back, but they've put in some beach dune sunflower. Um, looks like some other um, non-natives, looks like uh, dwarf golden dewdrop, some grasses, but it looks nice. And best part of all, if they just stop fertilizing the grass altogether, they're not adding any nutrients to that canal. Okay. Two more great plants for very sandy, sunny areas, Beach Morning Glory and the Railroad Vines. They will grow a lot, <laughs> but they're beautiful. Ibamias, absolutely, excuse me, absolutely gorgeous. Go ahead. Here's someone has a combination of, instead of lawn, sunshine mimosa, golden creeper for a hedge, and railroad vine down near the canal front. No fertilizers are being used whatsoever. None. Think of the cost savings. Never mind the environment. Think of the cost savings. And they're not cutting, cutting, cutting. Okay, go ahead. Blanket flower. Looks good with dune sunflower again. Native Florida wildflowers are no different than native wildflowers in Illinois. They have a shelf life. Wildflowers are annuals. They don't last forever, so please don't expect them to. Go ahead. Seaside goldenrod, great for butterflies. If you want to help the bees, put this plant in. Okay. Sea oxide daisy. Sea oxide daisy. It's found in those areas, and it looks beautiful. Go ahead. Here we have a mixture of tropical sage, blue porterweed, and pencil flower. All nicely sculpted, looking very formal. No fertilizer needed here, folks. None. Okay. So again, it's not just about the littoral zone. It's about transitioning from the water's edge to our back doors is where we need to start putting in more of those plants. Right at that intersection, sand cord grass. That's the grass you see in the high-end developments. $700,000 homes. They're using sand cord grass, a Florida native grass. <laughs> Thank you. 
and depending on you know there's so many different kinds of developments out there many of them actually have beaches now sea oats that'll hold everything in <laughs> no fertilizer needed here go ahead here we have the Ry Charlie Rice uh, on the left there standing underneath a limbed up cocoa plum. Cocoa plum is not a four foot tall hedge. It is a 15 foot tall shrub or small tree. <laughs> That's how it's supposed to look. You can hedge it, but in a few years it will look like crap because it's been butchered. Okay, I'm not going to mince words here. The truth is, if you trim a plant more than 20% of its mature height, you're killing it. So if a plant naturally gets 10 feet tall and you're pruning it less than 8 feet, you're killing the plant. That's not me. That's just science. Okay. So again, Florida privet is one of my favorite plants. You will find, I've seen it growing wild on Sanibel. Gorgeous shrub, stays smaller, 10 by 10, great hedge, great privacy hedge, great protection from storms. I should know mine protected me from Hurricane Charlie, and it can be hedged. You'll see on all these slides it says can be hedged. I'm a proponent of understanding and appreciating plants for their natural form and function. <laughs> so please try to go unhedged to begin with. Thank you. Go ahead. Mercine, another great plant. Under harsh conditions, this plant still does well and performs. Again, mulch only. Whatever the tree trimmer trimmed that day, mulch three inches to the drip line of your plants, and you're done. Okay. Salt bush, five minutes. Okay, we got to keep moving. Salt bush, absolutely gorgeous. If you have brackish water, here you go. Go ahead. White indigo berry, actually a very drought tolerant plant. Go ahead. Cabbage palm, Florida State tree. Unless it gets a direct hit, do not hurricane cut these trees. <laughs> or actually, it's a grass. Do not. You should never, ever, ever trim green off of any palm tree. Ever. You're killing the plant when you do that. It will sway in the wind and do just fine in a hurricane. Okay. <laughs> Uh, cypress trees, again, more for the water's edge. Go ahead. Slash pine, or as I prefer to call them, future bald eagle nesting sites. And, and it will attract them. <laughs> Beautiful plants that grow best in at least three because they communicate chemically under the ground. Dr. Thomas brought up the, the plants releasing chemicals to outcompete other plants. They know their own kind. And in Florida, we create plant communities, plants that are used to living together and are healthier because of it. Okay. Green and silver buttonwood can also be limbed up as a tree. When you're limbing up, you're not killing the plant as when you're hedging down. Okay. Sea grape. Great choice, not only on the beach, but a little further inland. Does really, really well. And you can take some branches out and see through it to see your lake. Go ahead. Here we have trees trimmed up so people can still have their view. They still have shade. Unfortunately, they still have turf grass. Okay. <laughs> Monitor and maintain your planted transitional and littoral zones. Weed, weed, weed until plants are established. No irrigation and no fertilizer does not mean no maintenance, unfortunately, because these are managed landscapes. It's not nature. Watch for invasive exotics and go to the next page. Here we go. Beautiful view. A little more what I call a real Florida skyline. The important question I have for everybody today is this. <clears throat> we now know that these Florida plants that are healthy and a natural part of your ponds require less nutrients. In the middle of the night, is there somebody running to Home Depot and buying bags of fertilizer and just dumping it in your pond? No. So where's the fertilizer coming from? Who's putting fertilizer in your transition zone. We are. So we made the decision to fertilize that turf grass, even though it doesn't need it.
trust me, it doesn't. I'm not, it's not making it up. I'm getting my information from turf grass experts. If we're the ones deciding to, lay, to fertilize, can't we be the ones to decide not to? End of my session. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. If you have any questions for Susan, uh, she will be here around. We're going to go quickly into one um, little video, and I promise this video is only 17 minutes, so it's a short. But the good thing about this video is that it's uh, three statements from volunteers, uh, citizens who have problems in their ponds, and they have done some solutions. And you'll see the three presentations, and they're already, yeah, ready to go. Stormwater ponds are engineered devices created to manage water from storm events, preventing flood and reducing runoff pollution. But as any man-made structure, they require maintenance to prevent them from becoming unpleasant and extending their functions. In this video presentation, we show three examples of actions taken by citizens like you to improve the conditions of their stormwater ponds in their communities. Okay, my name is Herb Shuckman. I live in the community of Island Walk, which is a community of 1,856 homes uh, spread out over 700 and some odd acres. Uh, we have 30 interconnected ponds that uh, we have had problems with, and uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our experiences. Going back to the year 2010, when my committee took over the, uh, were appointed to take over the study of the lakes, uh, we became very concerned because we found that uh, number one, the large bass were getting less and less each year. The amount of filamentous algae tended to increase every single year and was getting to be more and more of a problem. We were using more and more copper sulfate in the water to try and control the algae blooms. Uh, we found that there was occasionally a little odor coming out. Uh, the water had lost its clarity and was, uh, had more turbidity, and we realized that we had a problem. And so we went to the board in September of 2010 and said that we have a problem and we really have to start investigating what to do about it and to come to some solution. We found that our oxygen saturation levels had fallen down drastically and that uh, we had reached a point where the larger bass would not be able to survive that what happens is that as nutrients are come into the water, the bacteria normally present in the water break down the nutrients and uh, cause the uh, material to be taken care of. But when there's too much nutrients, uh, then what happens is the bacteria uh, work and they use up the available oxygen. When the oxygen is used up, the bacteria then die. And then you get a buildup of material that settles on the bottom as uh, as muck and you find also that the, you get a lot more filamentous algae uh, because of all the nutrients in the water. Uh, you find that your clarity of water uh, breaks down because of all that buildup of this material. In the first few years everything seems to look wonderful, seems natural. This fish, everything is doing well. In the year four to five we found that uh, in, after studying this we found that uh, you start to see that you're getting more and more algae blooms. You're using more and more chemicals every year to try and control it. You're finding that your water is starting to get a little more turbid. As the years go on and you get into year six and seven and eight, you start to see even more of the, of the above. And in some cases, you start to discover odor formation uh, that becomes sort of difficult for people to deal with. Uh, we believe, in, if, in all due honesty, that the uh, implementation of the aeration system is responsible for probably at least 85 to 90 percent of our success. However, uh, we don't know that. We just believe that. We know that the, solution, that the things we have done have given us a tremendous improvement. Uh, we have found that the, uh, we have accomplished an awful lot. Our ponds, the water clarity is increased dramatically. Our muck levels uh, we, was estimated by uh, South Florida Water Management, by an expert from there, to be uh, probably two to three inches deep in a community our age, which was 10 years basically at the time we did the aeration. Uh, 
when we sent down divers, which we did, we found that those depths were actually 12 to 30 inches. And in 17 months, we have reduced it 52 percent just because of the, what we did to date. So our uh, muck levels have actually dropped 52 percent. And this is one of the things you have to be very concerned about. That's what's filling in your ponds. That plus the erosion factors. And one of the reasons the ponds have to be uh, dredged every 25 years. You can do many things like we've done, which really should add another 20 to 25 years to that life before we'll have to dredge. Uh, we feel that the lakes and ponds, as they are actually are, are doing much, much better. We see that, they are, that all of our residents are really behind it and have supported us 100% of the way. And they all remark all the time about how much better the lakes and ponds look now than they used to look in the past. We have come to one conclusion, and that is the days of just looking at perfect grass meeting perfect water really can't exist in nature. When you have that, you have a situation that is going to break down. It's just a question of how long, when, and where. Hi, <laughs> I'm Joan Justice. I'm in Palm Island. Um, this, um, this was a project of ours to help save this little lake. This is a little lake. I live on the big lake. Uh, we were losing our shoreline really bad. Uh, when the rains came, you could see the, the lands wash away and the waving action would erode the, the, the shoreline and we were losing it and the pond was getting shallower. So uh, we, uh, we decided to try to uh, save the shoreline by putting two rows of rock at the control level and uh, then planting plants. Um, and uh, so far we have just about all of the houses uh, done except two. Um, the homeowners are paying for it and it usually costs them like $250 just for their frontage. Um, and uh, because we're doing it ourselves, it's, it's a lot cheaper that way. And the landscapers put it down. The county doesn't allow rickrack, uh, but they said that we could use the, the two rows of rock and we're calling it a border. So then we're planting plants uh, below the, that and uh, it's a definite line where the landscapers will stop and not keep cutting the plants down and the erosion will stop because the rocks are holding back the erosion. And it's, so far it's working out well. Most of these plants I've started from seed, so it hasn't been expensive for us to do the plantings. Well, um, there's duck potatoes. There's little cl clutches of duck potatoes. And then uh, the water cannas, the yellow water cannas. Um, they're in groupings. And then uh, the irises, the water irises, those are purple. And uh, I did put some bog lilies in here. Um, it's hard to get the seeds from the bog lilies to start those. Uh, but uh, as I collect them and start them, we put them over here. But we're, we're putting everything that blooms, things that bloom. The, the board was all for this in the beginning, but some of the homeowners uh, objected to it. And, uh, but as, as we've been working on it, they've all come around and they see how, the purpose behind it and how nice it's looking. So they're getting in on it too. And, uh, We've had uh, quite a few donations for some of the property, some of the common property, but most of the homeowners have uh, taken it upon themselves to put the money in and buy the rocks. My name is Larry Harvey. I'm on the Heritage Palms Community Development uh, District. Uh, I'm a vice chairman. Uh, we have been involved here at Heritage Palms uh, on the CDD since the takeover from the developer U.S. Home back in 2005. Uh, and we found that we're probably faced with the same situation that many of the communities in southwest Florida are finding themselves in now. And that is, is over the years, uh, erosion has been affecting our shorelines. And the two principal Ingredients for creating the erosion have been the wave action. Uh, this is where you have the high waves coming in uh, off of the lake and then beating against the shoreline and eventually over a period of time eroding away the shoreline. Uh, in many cases, sometimes threatening residential property that is adjacent to the lake shoreline. 
Uh, in addition, you also have sheet water runoff, which causes erosion. And this is the water runoff similar to what you think perhaps like with the uh, Colorado River and the Grand Canyon. The water accumulates in between the buildings on the low spots. The uh, gutters that have the downspouts, they're all centered into one given location. And during heavy rain, that water then forms and as I say, like a little river goes down and it washes out the shoreline uh, down on the shoreline uh, of the lake shoreline. So you have the two, two principal ingredients then for causing the erosion. And that is the uh, wave action from the lake itself and then sheet water runoff. When the CDD came on board in 2006 after the turnover, uh, and the CDD board was formed that is made up of residents uh, from within the community, I being living here in Heritage Palms. We were asked uh, by the developer, U.S. Homes, to take over the operational permit from the South Florida Water Management District, which previously had issued the constructional permit to U.S. Home. When we were asked to do this, we were looking at our lake shorelines, and we said, these shorelines are, they have tremendous escarpment, the vertical drop off on the lake shoreline. In other words, it's caused by the erosion. And we said there's many of the lakes out here that we don't think comply with the original permit, which requires that you have a four to one slope down to the shoreline. And then actually that four to one slope actually goes into the lake for a certain distance. Uh, and then it turns into a two to one slope as it goes out into the middle of the lake. Many of the lakes in with that escarpment and everything exceeded that four to one slope. And we said, we're not going to accept this, this permit because we're assuming all responsibility from U.S. homes at that time. We then said, okay, what are the best methods for going ahead and correcting this shoreline? And there are many different ways of, 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 of restoration as far as shorelines are concerned. The first one and the cheapest one that comes to mind is called basic restoration. And this is nothing more than bringing in some heavy equipment, putting a shovel or a scoop out into the lake, pulling it up to the shoreline, packing it down, shaping it, packing it, and then going ahead and putting uh, sod on top of it. Unfortunately, U.S. Homes had done this uh, about six months before we took over, uh, from before they turned it over to us. Within that six months, a heavy rain came, washed all the sod out, and the shoreline was back to its original state. So basic restoration is, while it's cheaper, it is a short-term solution to the problem as far as repairing shorelines. So with that, we said, okay, we need to find something else. The other alternatives that you have are riprap. And we have an example of riprap on this lake uh, across the way. And it's very effective in certain areas. And uh, so we utilize some riprap, very minor. And then we also have bulkheads. And we have an example of the bulkheads on this particular lake also that were put in by the CDD in, in combination with the Master Association. Again, this serves a specific purpose, but for an, it's very expensive to do and it's limited on how much you can do. For instance, the code for South Florida Water Management District says you cannot have a hard surface. Bulkheads and riprap are considered hard surface and you cannot exceed 40% of the perimeter of a lake with a hard surface uh, uh, restoration. Lee County is using, they use 20% as their guideline. You cannot exceed 20% of a lake's perimeter in a hard surface. Lee County happens to consider geofilter tubing, which we're going to talk about, and that's the main purpose for why we're here this morning, is to learn about geofilter tubing, or as I'll refer to as GFT. And there is nothing more, I will show you that the, it is relatively inexpensive in comparison with the other, other two, uh, the riprap and the, the bulkhead. Geofilter tubing process is one where they put a base bag down of a heavy, of, of, of a woven material, a plastic type woven material. They lay it out. They then put another smaller bag on top of that called the fill bag, which is of a woven material. They then, using a three-man crew, will put a boat in the water they will have a large diesel engine on that boat that is a suction engine that they put a eight inch pipe or flexible tubing into the lake at the surface. They'll take a diver in a wetsuit who goes down to the bottom of the lake with that suction hose, picks that sand and debris up off the bottom of the lake, 
comes back up through the boat. They then have a person up on the shoreline and they have a hole in the base bag, just a little hole where they put that eight inch tube in and then they force all of that sand and debris into that bag and they fill it up. And they can actually do about three to 400 linear feet a day by filling that bag up. And so they go all through the shoreline then filling that bag. They then come back and they take the fill bag, which is a smaller bag, and that's the bag that's the, wove, the unwoven material. They fill that bag. After all that is done, they come back and they slit the fill bag, which is now filled with all sand and, 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 and uh, foam or the contents of the bottom of the lake. They break that bag and then they spread it out. And it's almost all sand at this time. And that is where you're gaining back the four to one slope. And with that, once the, the sand is spread out and you've regained that four to one slope, they then bring in a sodding company who goes ahead and lays out, in this case, Floritam sod. And that covers all of the, the base bag plus the incline from the sand that forms the four to one slope. And that, that's what you see then is the sod that has been placed back on here. If U.S. homes had gone ahead and put in littoral plants, when they put this in, that we would not have had the escarpment that we have on all our lakes. This is something now that is required by code. Lee County requires it. And in 2005, the city of Fort Myers required it. At the time that U.S. homes built this complex, 1998 to 2000, 2001, the city of Fort Myers did not require littoral plants. They do now. I think that pretty well wraps up our exposure here to uh, at Heritage Palms as far as the use of geofilter tubing, why we did it, uh, where we did it, and some of the pluses and the minuses of geofilter tubing. Uh, I guess I would just like to conclude for communities who are finding themselves in a situation where they have a, a, a escarpment on their shorelines and they're looking at it and it's threatening uh, the property values and it's threatening the uh, uh, other aspects of their residential areas and other parts of their community is to go ahead and you can contact South Florida Water Management District, uh, Lee County. If you happen to be in, in an unincorporated Lee County, contact them. They have guidelines and suggestions as far as for uh, re restoration of shorelines. Uh, I think uh, you will find that uh, another integral part that should be emphasized that if you, any type of restoration that all the uh, community, all the uh, city and the county is recommending and encouraging and, the, and requiring by code the use of littoral plants. And so in our conclusion here with geofilter tubing, I'd like to put in that the littoral plants are an integral part of shoreline restoration and maintaining uh, the, minimizing the effects of erosion during the future. Right. Well, thank you. I want to tell you, I want to thank those volunteers who did that uh, talk. And they, the one thing that's common among all of them is that they work with the board. And the board allows them to do that. So it's an integral part that is working with the board because they're going to be putting the monies. And they, but they have to see that. They have to understand what is the, the benefit in the long term. It's not just like around the corner. In fact, the one thing, who maintains your pond? The HOAs, the CDDs. Uh, find about that. I mean, the proper management. I mean, all those, these are intricate parts of that maintenance of the pond. And the pond has to be maintained no matter what. So that's one issue. The resource to assist your organization, well, the NEP has this micro grant. So right now we're working on a project and we, along with the city, uh, the county, the county, the, the Division of Natural Resources is actually working with this. Um, and we have some other projects like the wet plan, which is right now going on. Um, you would like to add any more comments before we, um, I mean. I, I, well, this is the first time we've done this workshop presentation this way so any suggestions that you have are very welcomed anything about you know rearranging the order in which we've done the presentations information that you had hoped we would have addressed that we didn't or if there's a topic that maybe we over addressed also let us know um, we there is a web a, a website that just went live that we're working on called wetplan.org where we'll be putting these resources up there. Um, the 
presentations were recorded today and we've got the PowerPoint presentation, we will be matching them up. So if there's something that you want to go back, you know, to refresh your memory or a question about, that should be up. It might be about a month. Um, but on that wetplan.org, we will also have our information if you want to contact us directly if you have any questions. We would be happy, as other people have mentioned, to do um, shorter presentations to your HOA board, to your CDD, to your property manager, any of those sorts of things. Finally, I'd like to thank all of our presenters today and all of our cooperating partners um, without whom this would not have been possible. So um, I think I'd have to them all up there on the <laughs>